let's go ahead and talk a little bit now about imperialism and Europe's efforts to imperialize uh, specifically Africa, but really, really all over the globe, uh, Asia, Africa, uh, the Americas, uh, and so all of those efforts at imperialism. So first, uh, what exactly is imperialism? Basically, in a, in a nutshell, it's just the control of one nation over another. Um, and, and there's multiple ways that, that nations can try to control other nations. Uh, under the old way of doing things, you would go ahead and uh, you would go out and militarily conquer and, and discover or create colonies. Uh, this was the old way of doing things from the 16th century to the 19th century. This is how um, the United States came into being through English colonialization. Uh, and, and typically involved some level of military conquest. This kind of imperialism came to an end for several different reasons. Uh, one, the Napoleonic Wars in Europe forced European nations to have to keep more of their military forces at home uh, to counter the greater threats of their, their European rivals. Uh, the democratic and nationalist movements, uh, especially the democratic movements coming out of the Enlightenment, which emphasized equality and self-rule, didn't lend themselves very well to the idea of creating colonies or towards imperialism. And the nationalist movements uh, tended to, to go ahead and, and foster the creation of other nations rather than colonies. Uh, the Industrial Revolution also goes ahead and puts the old colonial model, um, makes it, makes it, begins to make it obsolete. And quite frankly, to go ahead and rule places as colonies uh, was just for, too, too expensive. You needed too many resources, you needed too much money, uh, it, it cost too much money. And so colonialism starts to fall by the wayside uh, during the 1800s uh, because, uh, in large part, because of the, the resources that were required to, to keep a place as a colony. Modern imperialism then, uh, just as old imperialism was, was killed by the Industrial Revolution, modern imperialism was really caused by the Industrial Revolution. As countries needed raw materials for their factories, as countries needed new markets to sell their things, uh, they went ahead and, and started to look for other places to go ahead and, and sell and buy stuff from. And colonies, again, served a similar purpose to that. Um, and that purpose didn't go away just because it was too expensive to keep a colony. So the same motivation that drove European countries to to go out and create colonies such as those here in North America drives them to continue to look for places, to look for more raw materials, to look for more outlets for their manufactured goods. And the modern imperialist idea uh, promised large pro profits for a very minimal risk. Uh, so it, it, was, it was an easy bet uh, that you could go ahead and you could manipulate and take advantage of less developed countries uh, without having to go ahead and commit large numbers of troops or large military forces uh, to go ahead and make a lot of money. And so it was very attractive. Uh, the other reason why they wanted to go ahead and, and create empires was to eliminate competition from foreign or from other European countries. In other words, Britain might want to go out and create colonies in Africa, not so much because it needs colonies in Africa for raw materials or markets, but because it doesn't want France to have those same colonies. And in that way, they're decreasing the amount of competition they face uh, from other European rival nations. So how does nationalism cause uh, modern imperialism? Well, countries sought to have uh, possessions or sought to, sought to have large empires because it made them look better. Because, as I say here, it, it caught, they, gave, they were gaining glory. They were glorifying their own country. Look how good we are. We have control of lands in Africa. We have control of lands in China. We have control of lands all over the globe. Look how powerful we are. Uh, another thing that uh, really nationalism played into was this idea that that the strongest cultures were those that were the best. And Europeans like to think of themselves as the best, that we are clearly the best culture. We are expanding more than others. And so we are the ones who should dominate. We are better than everyone. That's social Darwinism, the idea that the strong cultures survive, the better cultures survive, uh, and, and in fact thrive. This led into this, and, and this played hand in hand with nationalism, which was pride in one's nation. Uh, and, and so, this social Darwinist idea, where hey, uh, we're better than everybody else, so we should teach everybody to be like us, and that will make everybody better. Another reason why nationalism sought to go ahead and expand uh, it, using the imperial model was because these countries wanted to secure military bases around the world. This would enable them to protect trade routes and enable their countries to, again to gain prestige and to actually benefit economically because they would be able to go ahead and project force 
wherever they needed it with military bases around the world. These countries, as they were becoming more and more successful, mortality, infant mortality rates dropped, uh, life expectancy increased, so their populations were also growing. So Europe's population was expanding. They needed pl jobs for these people. They needed p places for these people to go. And one way to provide such places was through imperialism. So uh, as countries grew, they were seeking to expand. Uh, and, and they were also uh, nationalism. They were, they were seeking empires to safeguard their citizens. In other words, as as British citizens were traveling around the world, the British government wanted to make sure they were safe to travel around the world. That makes sense. Part of the government's job is to protect its citizens. Uh, and, and so uh, this was a way, through imperialism, for governments to protect their citizens, not only at home, but also around the globe. There were several different ways in which European countries did this uh, during the 1800s and indeed during the, the 1900s, the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, the first is concession. Uh, certain underdeveloped countries just simply gave up. They just said, fine, uh, come in and you can tell us what to do because quite frankly, you're obviously doing something right So, and we can't stop you. So uh, they conceded. Okay, we'll go ahead and we'll let you influence us. We'll let you kind of govern us. We'll let you tell us what to do uh, to whatever degree uh, they felt was permissible. Uh, another such instance would be something called a sphere of influence where a powerful nation might secure special economic privileges. Um, the best example of this would be China. Several European countries had spheres of influence in China where, uh, let's say for instance, Great Britain, that's probably the most notable, had Hong Kong. And in Hong Kong, uh, you know, Britain didn't have to pay harbor fees. They didn't have to pay railroad taxes. In Hong Kong, British citizens often had special treatment. They, they would be tried for crimes committed in Hong Kong, not in Hong Kong, but oftentimes they would go back to England or at the very least, they would be tried in an English court in Hong Kong, not a Chinese court. Uh, and, and so these spheres of influence, especially in China, were a popular way for European countries to go ahead and create an empire without necessarily having to colonize the area. Uh, another way was something called a protectorate. Uh, oftentimes, this happened uh, in Egypt, this happened in India for a time, uh, where the, the English would come in and they would use native rulers. They, they wouldn't topple the ruler. Uh, they would go ahead and prop the ruler up, but they would be able to manipulate the ruler behind the scenes and get the ruler to do what they wanted them to do. Uh, this is also called indirect rule. Uh, in fact, all of these, concession, sphere of influence, protectorates, these are all forms of what's called indirect rule, where a, 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 a European nation such as France wouldn't actually send over French people to govern their colony, Rather, they would govern the colony using local officials. So they would govern uh, French Indochina using Vietnamese officials or Cambodian officials. Uh, and this was a way for them to go ahead and control areas without having to, uh, to, to commit a lot of resources. Again, we said one of the problems with the old way of doing things with colonies was it was expensive. Well, one way to get around that was, hey, you didn't send your own workers there. You would simply work with the workers who were already there. Uh, the condominium uh, model was one where two nations would rule as partners. Oftentimes the, the uh, underdeveloped nation and the developed nation would partner up and they would work together in tandem with one another. And again, this was another way for Europe to create an empire without actually having to have a military empire. Annexation. Uh, this is uh, what happened to India. India uh, was ruled indirectly for a time using the uh, um, East India Company, uh, but that ended up falling away with the Sepoy Rebellion. The Sepoy Rebellion kind of puts a nix on that. And Britain basically goes ahead and makes India into a colony. Expensive, yes, uh, but uh, India was valuable enough to Great Britain, they were willing to go ahead and foot the bill for that. And so annexation would be an example of direct rule where British officials, in this case uh, somebody, a, a, a government official with the office, uh, with the title of a viceroy, would actually govern Great Britain, or would govern India. So uh, this would be an example of direct rule, making them an actual colony. That did still happen, although it was rare. And the last form of imperialism was something called a mandate or a trusteeship. Uh, this would be an area that was uh, monitored by international uh, uh, forces or international organizations. Uh, a great example of this would be Transjordan, which today is Israel and Jordan, uh, French Indochina, which today is Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos. After World War I, a lot of European countries got what were called mandates, and they were the idea was they were supposed to take care of them, and then they were supposed to prepare them for independence, and they were supposed to have their independence after a time. So what were the effects of imperialism? Well, there were some positive effects and negative effects, both on the colonies and on the colonial powers themselves. For the colonial powers, they got cheap raw materials. Uh, their, employ uh, their, their citizens were employed at a, uh, an increasingly high rate. 
Uh, they increase trade all over the world, and so the net result in the colon and the colonial powers in places like Britain and France, the standard of living was certainly improved because of imperialism. And they're able to go ahead and project their influence around the world, uh, and so they gain prestige and they gain power as a result of imperialism. However, it's not all roses for even the colonial powers. There was a price to be paid. It cost a lot of money to have an empire, so heavy taxes were often levied uh, by Great Britain, by France, by Germany, by Belgium, with an effort to go ahead and improve the colonies. Now, what does that mean? That means they were going to build railroads, they were going to build ports, things that they needed to go ahead and take advantage of the resources and raw materials uh, in, that they could find in their, in their desperate colonies around the world. Uh, unfortunately, it also required a larger military. If you had a big empire, uh, there would be little conflicts and little squabbles around the world that would require the use of force. Uh, and all of this costs money, so taxes go up because of imperialism. Uh, it creates colonial rivalries. Uh, Europe, uh, Europe ends up coming into getting into a couple of wars because the countries can't get along because they keep bumping into uh, each other uh, in their colonial empires. And so uh, these rivalries amongst the colonial powers uh, are really fomented by, by imperialism. Uh, it fosters a belief that the colonial peoples are inferior. So uh, certainly imperialism leads towards what today we would call racism. Uh, in the in the in the European countries, it creates hostilities between the colonies and the parent country, uh, which some of which are still lasting even unto today. On the colonies themselves, again, there were good effects, there were bad effects. Uh, some of the good effects, uh, the colonies got to develop their natural resources, and some of those colonies still benefit from the sale of those natural resources today. Uh, the European countries pay for modern transportation and communication systems. Uh, that go ahead and enable the country to go ahead and exploit more of their resources. Uh, a lot of the, the workers are trained and employed by the companies that, that come in. Uh, so there's jobs that are developed because of uh, these different companies and these different European efforts in Africa, in China, uh, in Latin America. Uh, you get uh, hospitals and schools that are built. Um, native hostility, so a lot of the fights between the different tribes. The Europeans didn't want that to happen because that would that would put a, uh, that would go ahead and interfere with production, and so they suppressed these native hostilities. They put down the rebellions, and so they brought stability with them. Uh, it introduces Western culture. What do I mean by that? Well, two concepts really. It introduces the concept of self-government. That that hey, you guys can govern yourselves. This was a Western idea that really the Europeans uh, had really been proposing and putting forward since the Enlightenment, if not before. And the idea of the rule of law, that, that governments were limited by written law codes. But there were certainly a lot of bad effects of imperialism on the colonies too. The wealth was drained from those countries, so even though the, they were being able to exploit more of their resources, a lot of the wealth generated from that exploitation didn't stay in the colonies. It discouraged the development of industry. The Europeans didn't want industrial rivals. They didn't want factories in Zimbabwe. They didn't want factories in Brazil. They wanted to be the ones to manufacture the goods because you could make more money doing that. Uh, and so they discouraged the development of industry in the colonial possessions. Uh, the exploitation of native workers. The native workers were oftentimes abused and taken advantage of. Uh, again, the racism that was developed in Europe uh, towards these colonial peoples. Uh, disease is spread uh, because of uh, the intermingling of different groups that carry different types of diseases. And so this is a certainly a negative effect of imperialism. And the artificial boundaries that are imposed. Uh, the Europeans sit down at a, in, in a conference in Berlin and they carve up Africa. The, the map of Africa that we know today was really not created by Africans. And so as a result, you have a lot of rival, eth rival ethnic groups that are in the same country and they don't usually get along with one another all that well. Uh, and so the, the artificial boundaries certainly are one of the problems and one of the bad effects that imperialism has on the colonial possessions.